well the 10th and last episode of our season one. Uh, we, well, we're actually very thrilled to announce that we've successfully come through with 10 whole episodes. And uh, well, we've had some very interesting guests. They've been generous enough to come on the show and share. Well, Unsuited started off as a collaboration between IDEX Legal and The Grey Matter at a time when we could all use some lightheartedness. Re reshifting focus now to our guest today. He is generally somebody who is known to have a very pleasant disposition. You'll often catch him smiling. He is a designated senior counsel practicing at the Bombay High Court and the Supreme Court. He has held two very important public offices and is also a winner of the Arya Chanakya Puraskar. Please welcome somebody who doesn't do interviews very often, so we've been fortunate, Mr. Darius Kambata. Good evening and welcome to the show, sir. Hi, Tansha. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Vikas, over to you. Hi, Darius, sir. How are you? Hi, Vikas. Good. Super. Um, so, again, welcome to uh, Unsuited. And, um, you know, we're really... I'm delighted to have you as our kind of the finale for the first, you know, for this episode and the first series that we put together for the legal community. You know, and our focus over the 10 episodes we've done and the uh, people we've interviewed is really to showcase um, the lawyer um, from a more personal point of view. So not simply the technical expertise and brilliance, but really the kind of interests and insights that lawyers have in their, their kind of personal life. You know, and we're looking forward to diving into those aspects with yourself as well today. Um, so you're, you're a third generation lawyer, uh, you know, your grandfather and uh, father being lawyers. Um, but technically you mentioned um, that you didn't really have anyone looking out for you when you started off as a junior counsel. So how did you make that kind of decision to pursue counsel practice? Well, it's, it's probably not correct to say I didn't have anyone looking out for me when I was practicing as a junior. Uh, but yes, I didn't have anyone from the family uh, in the profession. Uh, and I think what really helped me, uh, probably a game changer was the fact that I had a, a fantastic senior in, in Iqbal Chagla. Uh, and I was part of a great chambers, uh, which was at that point, the senior most member was uh, Karshaji Baba, uh, one of the great seniors of our time. And uh, to be under Iqbal Chagla, who was a leading senior, a great senior at that point. And I had a, a superb set of colleagues in chambers who really looked after me well. I, Janak Dwarkadas, Fredun Devitri, Jimmy Avasya, and for a wee bit uh, at the beginning, Roington Nariman. Uh, they were all there. And, and uh, I think that that's what really made the big difference. It, it just became like a family. And, and once you have that backing and background, yeah. then you're here to do better. Yeah. How did, how did you make that kind of decision to go work, you know, at, you know, for example, um, uh, you know, Iqbal Chagla's office in particular? Was that something you looked out for or you kind of found yourself there? Well, it's a bit of both, actually. So uh, this is a chambers that my father was part of in the early 19 or mid 1950s, rather. Uh, so uh, Iqbal Chagla was always a family friend and uh, I think he was the logical go to. Uh, and my father, actually, my father said, I'll set you up and I'll speak to him. I, I knew him because he'd always known me as a child, but I, I didn't really have a, a, in that sense, a very close friendship at that stage with him. Uh, so it was my father who set me up. And I think that's one of the best things my father's done for me. Okay, wow. Uh, what, what were those early days like, you know, um, going off to work, you know, at the chambers of, you know, Iqbal Chagla? You know, they were, they were tough, but they were great fun. Uh, we, you know, I, I don't know, most people probably of your generation don't even understand uh, even the 70s and 80s. And I, I really started in 85, so I got my son a few months before that. Uh, there was no internet. I mean, can you imagine a world without internet, a world without social media? Uh, so all our research had to be done uh, using books. Uh, there, there, were, there, was, there was barely Xeroxing machines. The, photo, the old photostat machines were in vogue and a few Xeroxing machines. There were no printers as we have them today. There were certainly no laptops. A few people had personal computers, but they were humongous sort of things, uh, big boxes, which, which, which always seemed to fail. Uh, <laughs> so it was a different world. 
But uh, nevertheless, we had loads of fun. I, I think there was more time to have fun. Uh, there were there were these huge stretches where you had no earning and no work, and that that's 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 the way the bar is. Uh, but we learned a lot. Uh, we worked a lot. We played a lot. I think it it was great. You know what? My my twelve year old would probably say that was ancient history. I mean, he he called he calls me old, saying that you know I was you know I'm from the nineties, but I'm an, I'm a bloomer and an oldie. So I think if I tell him about that world, then he'll say that's ancient history to him. Yeah. Um, so, and then, then you, you know, and then how, how long were you at the chain? You know, you were at the chambers for a few years and then you went off to do your LLM you know, at Harvard. No, uh, I, why I, what I did was I huh. actually joined chambers for a few days in 1984 after I got my son up, but I didn't really do anything of, of note. Uh, and then I went off to get my master's. And when I came back in June 85, that's when I really started practice. So um, okay. So you went, you went and completed your LLM first, and then you came back. And yeah, working. wisely so, I think. Okay. Wisely so. Yeah, yeah. Well, why, think, why did you choose that path, though? Like, why choose to go to Harvard to choose a master's uh, before coming back? Uh, I I did once. I I'd been educated entirely in India, and yeah. that the legal education was not of the quality that you have today. You had no national law schools, for example. Uh, there were a few good law schools, but you really didn't get a good quality legal education. And, and the learning that we had was really more uh, because we were all part of law firms, even while we were doing, whilst we were doing an LLB. Uh, and we also did, I did a lot of mooting. That's why I learned my law essentially. But uh, no, it, there was no real great classroom interaction barring one or two professors. We didn't have a great quality of instruction, quite frankly. So I was yearning for some good legal education and uh, it, it wasn't a certainty that I would remain in the law. It, it wasn't some great fiery passion of mine that I should become a lawyer. So mm -hmm. I might well have gone out of the profession even at that stage. Uh, so I just wanted to see what, what legal education was all about. And after going uh, to the Harvard Law School, it, it blew my mind. It just blew it open. Uh, I, I suddenly realized what all this was about uh, and how you could think, how you could analyze, how you could be critical, how you could, uh, I mean, the first thing we learned is that there is never just one solution to a problem. There are always two or three competing solutions and you've got to learn how to balance those and, you know, it, all sorts of things. So uh, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. And was that, was, that, was that very new for you, given the kind of education and rote learning and strict kind of structures we have in the Indian legal system. Was that all very kind of new that you could challenge different completely, ideas? Completely new. I remember my first couple of weeks, it was nightmarish. I said, what's going on here? Uh, and, and fortunately, uh, the, the orientation program had told us that a lot of foreign students feel this way because the Socratic method and the way they teach at Harvard is they don't teach you from A to Z. So they won't pick up an act and, and for, for example, contracts, they won't start with consideration, or consent or something like that. They'll throw you straight into legal problems. Uh, and it's like, it's like setting up a jigsaw puzzle. So when the first few pieces are put on the board, you don't know what the hell they mean and where they, they lie. And you're completely confused. But as the puzzle starts taking shape, then your understanding and comprehension of what's going on is far sounder than if you just learn by rote. So it takes a little time. But once it can, it, they said it'll click in two weeks, three weeks, maximum a month, it'll click for everyone. They were absolutely right. It took me two weeks, it clicked. And it was, it was superb after that. Uh, Tanisha, you wanted to say something then? I wanted to check in to see aside of the, you know, the lessons and uh, the exposure to education. Uh, as a student in a foreign country uh, early on, you know, in the 80s, what was that experience like? Because I'm guessing you hadn't gone out of the country to study any time before that, right? That is my first uh, first trip for, for academics. I'd, I'd been the year before uh, to that Philip Jessup moot court competition where right. I had a friend, Amit Haryani, who's, who's a leading lawyer today, uh, represented India. But okay. apart from that, I hadn't really had any experience of, of academics abroad. So it, it was fast. The whole university is wonderful. There's so many streams. There's so much going on. Uh, you can do just about anything you want. Uh, so it's just the life there is the learning as well. 
Uh, and uh, Harvard has this fantastic advantage of having a, a beautiful campus, but you're on the edge of a major city, Boston. Mm -hmm. So you're 10 minutes away by underground. You can be in a huge city. You can be back in campus. Uh, so there was tons to do. It was one year was far too short. So was that the you first know, time you lived in a dorm as well? Yeah, absolutely. And they were, they were terrible dorms, I must tell you. <laughs> and for that, because they were, we were put up in the dorms. Everyone stayed there. All, all the law school candidates stayed there. They were almost prefabricated because they were built just after the Second World War. Uh, they were really, the, the walls were thin. Uh, the, the heating was appalling in the sense that in, in winter, uh, you couldn't, there was no thermostat and you, there was, you, you couldn't mm -hmm. fix the temperature. So it was like you were in your room, windows closed and you were burning with heat. You know, you, you couldn't sleep sometimes. And if you opened your window, you got minus 20 degrees coming at you. Mm -hmm. So... It was either freezing cold or, or really being in a furnace. So it wasn't great, but we all, all settled down and, and learned to, you know, figure out what, what to do in those sort of situations. Keep your window slightly open and things like that. So you learned, you learned to clean your own dishes and cook as well? I'm sorry. No, I, I, I've never learned how to cook. Can't boil an egg, as they say. Um, I, but you I learned, to what, you learned to clean dishes and wash clothes and all the foreign uh, student life? Uh, well, I had to wash clothes. My, my parents bought me an iron. And it was, a, it was a traveling folding iron they gave me. And when I came back to Bombay, I, I gave it back to them unopened. <laughs> I managed a whole year without ironing my shirts, which must have been disastrous. But anyway. <laughs> and did you have anything akin to like a prom night? Or did you have anything similar to, you know, one of those very uh, fancy graduation ceremonies that we say yeah. in the movies? Yeah. All of that happened. Yeah, there was there was lots of fun. They would they would make sure we were entertained almost every week or two weeks, and the commencement, which is what they call what they, they call it commencement, not graduation, because you commence into life uh, okay. after that ceremony, um, was was a grand affair. We had the chairman of the then Federal Reserve Board, Paul Walker. He was the chief guest, and he spoke brilliantly. I remember. Wow. It was a common commencement for the whole university. So it sounds like an incredible year, like almost, and also very transformative in terms of your own personal experiences, academic experiences. So um, why did you choose to come back so quickly then? You know, I've never regretted this decision because when all is said and done, home is home. Uh, and uh, I think there are many, many plus points that we have here, uh, which we might not have if we were a setting abroad. Uh, and of course, there are, there are pros and cons, but I've never regretted coming back. I think it's, it's I wouldn't dream of living anywhere else. Uh, and uh, I had family here, so there was no question that I was coming back. You don't regret, you know, doing enough, you know, spending some time working there for a couple of years, you know, any of those kind of... Yeah, well, that, that is maybe one of, one of a, a small tinge because... Uh, you know, for the Harvard NLM, I'm not sure whether the others required it, but uh, you, you are required in addition to your courses to do a thesis. And it's a fairly intensive thesis, which you have to work on through the year. Uh, so you then present your thesis at the end of the year and, and they grade it and things like that. So the professor under whom I was doing my thesis, who happened to be my corporate law professor as well, he was very keen that I stay on and do a doctorate, which they call an SJD. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you could probably get by by spending another year of act, uh, at the university taking courses. Uh, then you could do your research even in your home country. And the whole thing took about three years. You'd have to come back to defend your, your major research thesis. So that was very tempting. But it meant spending about a year more. Uh, and uh, since I'd already joined Chambers in Bombay and I was happy with that prospect, I just took a call and decided it's more important to come back. Oh, wow. And I always felt I'll go back and do that doctorate, but I never did, of course. Okay. Might still um, do it, but... You could still do it, yeah. There's ne you know, there's never a... Uh, never too late. Mm -hmm. Never too late. Yeah, never too late. That's right. Um, so, then, so then you came back and you kind of threw yourself into, you know, council practice. You know, and like you mentioned already, we all know that um, the gestation period for council practice can be long. You know, and that, that whole road is, you know, can be quite prolonged and uncertain. Um, so it's really about, you know, what advice would you give to kind of 
um, law, you know, first generation lawyers, you know, and those wanting to pursue practice at the bar today? I think it's pretty, it's pretty similar. It was a longer gest uh, gestation period in my time, but then my seniors told me it was even longer during their junior days. So, <laughs> Uh, in fact, it's quite short today. Uh, but uh, what I would say is keep up your standards. Never let your standards drop. So just to do a whole lot of work uh, at a low standard, rather than saying no a few times and, and you know, doing your work well, I think that's always the, that's the trick. And you've got to plug away. You've got to do an immense amount of work. It's hard work. I suppose in any profession, you've got to work hard. So hard work is a given. And don't expect to be remunerated or compensated commensurately with the work you do. I mean, I have this old fee book of mine, which was a physical fee book in those days. And sometimes just once in a long while I open it and I go through all those fees. I mean, things like what we call five GMs and 10 GMs, which is equivalent to 75 rupees or 150 rupees for work that took me hours and days to do and never got paid for it. Uh, they're all outstanding fees. But... Uh, <laughs> I think I got paid for in terms of the value and what I learned. And as I said, I had a very, very uh, protective senior. I had a very protective chambers. There were other people who would help out. Uh, and you know, this is, a, this is a profession. I know we've got a bad name as a profession, but at least what I found is it's an extended family. So you had, uh, you know, in Bombay, we have the, we follow the dual system of solicitors or firms briefing counsel. And I had, two or three solicitors in my junior days who really didn't know me uh, and didn't even know my family, but they took to me and they gave me such encouragement. Uh, they didn't have to, but they did. Uh, and they took a risk, I suppose, in doing that. Uh, Chambers was very, very encouraging. My senior would be very encouraging and we would do matters for him and he would, uh, we would then be briefed with him. Uh, and, you know, the other thing about our profession, and we have to say this, is that so many judges were kind to us juniors. This, this, judges are still kind, but I remember in those days, they were so kind to us. Uh, they, were, they were strict, um, make no mistake, it's not that they gave us indulgences, but they were extremely kind and encouraging. There's so many I can think of who encouraged me, they didn't know me, some knew me, some didn't, but uh, it really helped. I think that really helped me. What, okay, have you got any kind of examples of that when you say, you know, the judges were kind? Um... So I, take, take Justice Pense, for example. Uh, Justice Pense was the sort of judge who never raised his voice, but he could demolish the senior most of counsel uh, in a very quiet, with a smile on his face. In fact, when he smiled at you, that was dangerous. Because that, that <laughs> at the end of the but I remember arguing a matter before him. When now in, he let me argue for a couple of hours. When I look back, most of that argument was gibberish. The point uh, on which I succeeded and where he was with me was a five minute point. But he <laughs> let me, for, for Justice Pense to do that because he was otherwise impatient. I mean, he was obviously just doing it out of kindness. And he very politely heard me, nodded and then gave his judgment immediately. There was, there was Justice Sujata Manohar who was very encouraging. Justice Kanya, who then became Chief Justice of India. He was so kind, Justice Barucha. Uh, Justice Chandurkar, they were, they were very, very kind judges we had. Later, of course, Justice Sri Krishna, but that was much later, but, but these judges were so, so, nice, so good to us. Yeah, and you found that they were kind, considerate, you know, was that kind of tough love across all the different junior council, or was it something that... Yes, no, no, I, there were no special favours. That, that, uh, if, if you test, you see, we, shouldn't, you, we, ne we could never take advantage of their kindness. And if you tested their patients, you were asking for it. But if they saw Junior was well prepared, uh, they, gave a, they gave a very good hearing. Mm. Uh, and there was, there was Justice S.K. Desai, one of the most brilliant judges uh, of our court. And he had this habit of, of shouting at, at the council and intimidating a council sometimes. But great quality. He'd do that for everyone, whether you were junior or senior. That made no difference. Uh, and again, if you were well prepared, you got, got by in his court. And did they give you kind of any off the record kind of guidance? Like, you know, when you said the judge that let you argue for two hours, did you get any kind of off the record feedback saying, you know, look, what you could learn from that experience later? Well, sometimes you do. 
but but usually the the tradition in the Bombay High Court is to maintain a, a distance between judges and counsel. So it's not that you can have a chat about the matter later. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that's a good thing, actually. And that's the way it should be. I wish other courts also did that a lot more. Uh, but, uh, but you could sense from the way they were, they were reacting to you in, in court that... Uh, I, I remember Justice Sridhartha Manohar in one matter. Again, I argued a lot. And she very, very politely wrote in her judgment that he then argued this and this. And I really couldn't understand the relevance of this argument. <laughs> <laughs> but she was right. She was right. But, you know... If you let me argue it, that is good. All right. Okay. okay. So, so we're curious to ask you next, you know, you've held two very important public offices and they've, they've been back to back really. So you were the additional solicitor general of India and then the advocate general of the state of Maharashtra. So, you know, when you go from private practice into holding public offices of this stature, what is really the shift one needs to make, you know, whether it's mentally, whether it's actually practically also in terms of your work? Uh, will you share a little bit about that journey? So you're, you're right to ask that it's actually a, a very uh, different type of a, a law office and lawyering mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, as a law officer, you really owe a duty. Uh, every lawyer owes a duty to the court, of course. But you owe a public duty. And I think many people don't understand it. You're just not a glorified lawyer for government. Uh, and you don't have to win every case for government. It, this is the, the biggest fallacy uh, that I'm finding increasingly that we are seeing. A law officer is appointed and, and an advocate general is a constitutional office. He's appointed to occupy an office. And he's meant to be the leader of the bar precisely because he's not just meant to be a mouthpiece of government. And you are required in cases where the public interest demands to concede, uh, to not to uh, advance a point of view. To be very, you must remember that a law officer is has to set an example for the bar, for the rest of the bar. So you have to be temperate, you have to be restrained. You don't have to win at all costs. It's not a race. Uh, you're doing a duty there. Uh, it's, it's extremely important. That's not to say that in a case where government deserves to win, you don't. Do your hardest to win. Of course you do. You, you slog. You have to work much more because the input that you get is, is, is less than in a private matter. So you have a private lawyer with a big team of lawyers and juniors opposing you. And you have to do all the slogging on your own, maybe with just one of your juniors with little input. But you, it doesn't mean that you have to uh, win at all costs. I think that's the most. You have to see the public interest, particularly in PIs. Uh, and I think we are losing sight of this uh, very, very important distinction between law officers and other lawyers. Uh, so, so yeah, you have, you, have, you have to put on a different hat. It's difficult because you come from a private law practice where you're, you're really fighting it hard, but you, you've got to stop yourself. You've got to restrain yourself. Uh, you've also got to be able to give uh, advice to government that they might not want to hear. So you've got to do that. Uh, and you, you should do that in writing always, I believe, because it's important to have that on record not oral because that can be misconstrued uh, and the other thing you have to be careful and that is the most stressful part of the job is unfortunately you can't always assume that your client the officers instructing you want you to succeed it's a very it's, it's, you, you have to constantly look a little behind your shoulder to see whether you've, you've taped up all ends uh, and you're not you're not being led into a, a, a sort of a on the wrong path. So, so that, that's something you don't, in, in a private litigation, obviously your client wants to win. Mm. Uh, but that, no, that assumption doesn't always work. I'm not saying in most matters, but in some matters you have to be really careful about what the instructions you receive and, and how, uh, how much you accept them. So that, how that's do you, it. How do you, um, is that a skill set that you have to develop yourself or is there any kind of support structure that helps you understand those nuances of what, you know, how people are trying to um, influence you and maybe down the wrong direction, like you mentioned. Yeah, so look, it, it's hit and miss maybe, and maybe I miss sometimes and I, I'm none the wiser even today. So I'm not saying that, but there were, there were occasions when I did, uh, I, I did find that I had been wrongly instructed. Uh, and uh, you have to be very careful. That said, I must tell you that the other thing I learned working for, 
the law office and, and you're working for the law office, you're not working for government. That's a big distinction. Uh, is that there are a number of superb bureaucrats in our system. It, it's actually very reassuring because especially the IAS system, there are some fantastic officers. I mean, they would easily be able to head a large multinational corporation, uh, even larger than that. They, they are tremendous guys. I, they, they've really given their lot to the system. So some people you could rely on completely uh, and you'd get tremendous input from them. But, you know, it's a mix. Mm. Understood. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Well, our next question is really more to do with work-life balance. So uh, you're, you're a huge evangelist when it comes to work-life balance. And in one of your interviews, you've actually said that you would really like more, uh, you know, life and play and lesser work. So, you know, we're in times where actually work-life balance is something that largely eludes the lawyer community. And I'm sure you've heard enough and more stories where, you know, especially uh, with law firms, sometimes even with corporates, people are unable to take adequate breaks. They're unable to, you know, uh, whether it's a sabbatical, whether it's a holiday, whether it's time out on a weekend. Uh, lawyers are not really choosing to hit the reset button anymore. And mm -hmm. it's definitely, you know, impacting their mental and physical health at many levels. Mental health, probably more, uh, more concerning at the point. Do you really have a thought and view on this? Because you are somebody who really values pursuing hobbies, taking time out, right? Well, I think it's, it's, I feel it's important to maintain a balance. It's not easy to do it. And it's not that I, I admire some of my colleagues who do it religiously on a day-to-day -day basis. They maintain a balance. I can't do that. Honestly, I don't maintain a day-to-day -day balance. But uh, I, because I find when I get into a complex matter, it, it just engulfs me. I'm thinking about it all the time. Uh, and it's difficult for me just to divorce myself from it. But uh, equally, I make sure that I have breaks in between. And I think that's important because you think better if you have breaks. Uh, I've, I mean, we've heard of the legendary lawyers of the past. And there are, of course, one or two sterling exceptions. Uh, you know, people like Nani Falkiwala apparently were workaholics uh, in their time. Right. But I think there were exceptions. By and large, uh, the lawyer needs a break because he needs to think. And you have more than just reading away and, you know, you, you need to sometimes think about complex matters, which we don't do enough. So you, you have to have that balance. You have to break away from your papers. True. But what would you say to workplaces, really? Because, you know, one is the individual lawyer. So if you're in counsel practice, you probably have a better choice that you're able to make because you're on a, largely you're on your own. But what about if, say, you work with a law firm, you have a demanding partner or you're in a company and you have a very demanding general counsel who believes that, you know, breaks are bad, like views breaks as negative or time out as negative. What would you say to those kind of people? Well, that's tough. What, what can one say? Because uh, they are, they are in a pro they've chosen a path in the profession which requires them to work for someone else. Mm. Uh, that initially gave them security as juniors, security that we counsel never had. So we took the path of complete insecurity in our first five, ten years, even now. Uh, there is no security that a client or a matter comes back to you. You're not there that day, you've lost it. Kidding. So uh, it's an insecure part of the profession. On the other hand, we get freedom. Uh, whereas you rightly says in a, in a firm, uh, you have to work for someone, so you have to slog. Hard work has never, uh, never killed anyone, really. Uh, yeah. Let's be very clear about that. So I think all the slogging is, a, is not a bad thing at all. Mm -hmm. It's just that you've got to be able to make time for a break at some point. So that's a balance that hopefully your firm also is conscious of. Good. Thank you for saying that. I hope, I hope everyone's listening. So <laughs> thank you. Well, um, you mentioned that it's important to um, take some time off to, you know, be able to um, have your brain think, you know, and like kind of mull over things. So what kind of activities do you do to take time off so that you can get that, you know, thinking time into your, in, into so, your work? Uh, well, I try and squeeze in a, a walk on a few evenings every week, but that's not enough. Uh, I listen to music. That, that, that really helps a lot. Uh, again, I don't do it religiously every single day, but yes, I do try and, and, and get it in. And, and particularly now with streaming and, and phones, uh, you, can, you can listen to music while you're walking, you can listen to music when you're in the car, so it makes a difference. But yeah, things, listening to music has helped me a lot, actually. Super. So, Any favorite track you have for uh, 
helping the thinking process most? Is it like a, a track? It could be, could be anything. And I love Western classical music. The, the scale is so vast. I mean, most people don't realize this. It's, it's, it's humongous. The amount of music there is, I think a, a, certainly a lifetime is not enough to really even get to know the, the great works. So mm. it's, there's a lot, there's lots of music, anything. Really. Yeah. Um, and just going back to your, your career today, so obviously, you, you know, you started in 1985. Um, and, you know, you've had that incredible journey, you know, to where you are today as a senior advocate as well. Um, so what, what still keeps you motivated today? You know, what are your kind of drivers? That you have a, you know, in your career today. I don't know. How does it change I, versus when you started in 85? I'm enjoying my work more and more. That's a funny thing to say. Wow. And I'm enjoying it more and more. And, and I, uh, I really feel, uh, especially in more complex matters, harmonizing the law, conflicting judgments, setting out a clear legal solution or a path, and assisting the court by offering that path. Uh, gives a lot of satisfaction, actually. And, and that's really, when I do matters, I'm more anxious that the, I, I, I mean, most, most good lawyers would never mislead a court on the law. I, 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 that doesn't happen, actually. I mean, in your, a certain level, it just doesn't happen. But uh, many of them would uh, maybe throw a heap of judgments at the court. Perhaps they are not clear in their own thinking. So it's, it's a challenging task to to work out what the law really is on that, in that particular aspect, in that matter, and then to try and present it and to make sure that the facts, your facts have some place in that matrix. And I think that challenge and the task of doing that is, is one of the most satisfying things you could do. It's obviously not as satisfying as being a judge because in judge, you then decide to, you can, you have a chance to lay down that law mm -hmm. uh, and, and to do justice. So that's, that's a higher satisfaction, but at least if you assist in that process, then that's, that's something that's, that's, that's really enjoyable. Yeah. And how, how has that changed over, over your career though? So, you know, when you started, you know, what, what was the kind of motivators then to now that, you know, you've accomplished, you've got an accomplished career. So obviously your motivations are much more to no, you start, You're really doing a lot of preparation for someone else. You're, you're, you're trying to uh, digest a complex set of facts, put them down into a list of dates, try and maybe do some submissions, do a lot of research for law. Uh, but the more, the, the further you get in the profession, the, the greater you have a chance to mold the argument and to place it in a particular way. Uh, and I think that is, that is the most satisfying as also the most challenging part of our profession. Mm. And often any there's tips? no one answer. As we learned in law school, often there's yeah. no one answer. Super. Any, any tips you could give to um, younger lawyers who are, you know, kind of on that career path themselves about what they need to do to develop their own skill set, thinking to get to the level of think satisfaction. What really helped me, it still helps me, but I have less and less time for it is when you have to uh, research the law. And let me tell you, everyone has to research the lawyer, the lawyer who tells you that I know the law completely. Uh, well, less said the better. But anyway, uh, <laughs> everyone researches the law. But I think the important thing is to read about it or around it. You don't only just research that one narrow point. You pick up a good commentary and you read around the topic. You understand that whole topic. You learn so much. You, you get a lot of, I get a lot of ideas that way. Uh, and that, even if you don't actually use it in that matter, it, it stays with you. And somewhere down the line, that, that knowledge uh, accrues. So I would advise every junior, if they have chance to do research and to read uh, in a particular manner to do research and to read the law, then do it a little wider than necessary. Can, can you give it like a practical example of that? Like, like, you know, maybe there's a case you're doing at the moment. So what is your process for deep diving and do that kind of also research around the uh, matter? Look, your process, when you're arguing a matter and, and particularly if you've got a team of lawyers with you, uh, is less research on your own, which is a pity, mm. but I have less time for my own research. Uh, and you have to leave that to your juniors and other people in the team. But what you can do is guide them. Uh, and you might, I, I still, when there's a complex issue and there's a good legal commentary, and I'm saying it has to be a good commentary, I still pick up a book and I still broadly read on the topic to see where this fits into the matrix. Uh, and, and you get ideas and then you guide your team. 
uh, accordingly. So yeah. it's, it's important to read around the topic rather than just the narrow bit that you're researching. Okay, great. Um, and then we, you've already, uh, you mentioned a few of your kind of anecdotes earlier with, you know, your instances, you know, with the, with the, with judges you know, during your career, but um, any other kind of, fa you know, funny stories or narratives you have, um, you know, from your career that you'd like to share? Let me not make it mundane, but let me give you the, the, the great legendary anecdotes about other lawyers. Uh, and, and, and there's, always, there's a parable to these anecdotes. I, the, the greatest stories are always about C.K. Daftari, who was uh, a Bombay lawyer, uh, advocate general, then went on to be India's first solicitor general, uh, and then ultimately attorney general. And uh, he was, to, to many, many feel, and particularly those who've seen him feel, he was the greatest advocate. That is his oratory, his, his skills of persuasion, uh, his English was, was superlative. Uh, but he had, a, a lot of lawyers I've spoken to have seen him say he was also a fantastic lawyer in terms of his legal mind, often under, uh, underestimated. Uh, but when he was law officer, uh, he kept an independence from the government. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of his famous stories. He was arguing as advocate general to defend the Bombay Prohibition Act which first came in the state of Bombay, one of the, the earliest case, F.N. Balsara's case, challenging that. And he was actually defending the statute. And at one part, point, he was asked uh, by the bench a very serious question, which apparently arose in the entries of, that they were considering on competence. And they said, uh, Mr. Daftari, so what is the greatest intoxicant? Well, they were talking about different intoxicants and alcohol and things like that. And he paused for a moment, looked them squarely in the eye and chuckled a bit and said, power. Power is the greatest intoxicant. Now that was clearly a dig at the powers that be, who were, who were his clients. Uh, he also made that fantastic remark in the same, in the same matter, uh, saying, because he liked his evening drink. So he said that uh, a republic without a pub is nothing but a relic. You take the <laughs> pub out of pub with a relic. So again, the powers that we didn't like all this and he actually, uh, the, the then chief minister gave instructions that the final closing bit of argument, which remained to be done, was not to be done by Dr. Wow. Punia. But, but what, the story behind that great humor, and it was all on, on, on the spur of the moment, it was all off the cuff, was the fact that he showed his independence. He was asserting his independence. And I think that is so important. Mm. So with humor, he, he really, and, and courts are a fun place. I mean, I don't think judges or lawyers should be taking themselves so seriously all the time. And it's always better when a judge or a lawyer is, you know, has a lighter moment or two in court. So speaking of that, tell us some story that's done the rounds about you, please. Oh, I don't know. I, that, you, that you'd have to ask someone else. Ask someone else. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's a lot of fun in court. There, there is a lot of fun in you know, again, uh, this is a common misconception clients have that they expect you because they are at the throat of your, the opposing clients. They expect you to be at the throat of the opposing lawyer. Uh, and that just doesn't happen because often it's, it's a very good friend you're who's on the other side. And though sometimes one does get carried away in court, the firm rule is at the end of the day, he's your friend. Both of you are doing your duty. There's no need to go for his throat. You, you, you attack the other side's client if you have to. Uh, but, uh, you know, keep things at a civil and moderate level. There's no, and, and that also is better for the judge. The courts prefer that. So uh, a little humor always helps, actually. Who, who were some of the funniest uh, advocates that you went up against? Oh, there were, or even judges. I wouldn't say funniest. I would say many with a, with a Quick good sense. Yeah, so good that, sense of humor. That, that's for the private part of this interview. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and is that something you miss? Because when we were talking to um, Rajni Ma'am last week, she mentioned that you know, that's something that she really misses, that the court humor being there, um, that um, even with digital court systems and this whole debate around that, it's something that is really, you know, she's really missing at the moment. I think things are getting a little too serious. Uh, you know, I think that the stress levels, the pressure of arrears, the pressure of, of litigation, uh, has got so much that sometimes one loses that lightheartedness, which is so important uh, in court. 
Yes, mm. that, that, is, that is a change. I've noticed that in my career that uh, there was more time for, for good humor in the, in the early days. Also, right now with the lockdown and not physically seeing each other in court, whether it's judges, clients, your peers, I'm sure there's, there's less a scope to build that humor at the moment, right? Yeah, there is. It's, a, it's, it's difficult. Remote hearings are always more difficult than physical. You have to work harder. Uh, it's not the same as physical. And I sincerely hope that sometime down the line, we go back to full physical hearings. But while we have to do this, then we must all adapt and learn how to do it on, on the remote. We, we, I mean, there's no reason why we can't adapt. And all of us have learned. Uh, Every, to... Everyone has yeah, figured a me method around the virtual courts. And Which is good. good. That's what a good system should do. Super. So, Tanisha, you want to go into the demo Absolutely. round? So that brings us to the end of the first segment, which we've called the interview. Uh, we now move on to the second segment, which is called the demonstration round. Uh -huh. We are now. Sorry, so I will I will log off for this bit. We'll come back at the end when we do some Q and A. Great, great. Tanisha is much more that. fearsome to deal with. Oh God! Okay, <laughs> please, <laughs> Vikas. Okay, so, uh, well, this round, as you know, is called the demonstration round, and we're going to request you to demonstrate a skill, really. So, what do you have for us today? I am completely without talent or skill. I have to make this confession straight away. Uh, so, I have done the next best thing. I have two very talented children, Super. and I've asked my daughter and my son to be here. Uh, so my daughter composes her own music and sings and she's going to sing you a number. Okay. Uh, and my son is actually a composer of music and their, both their music is on Apple music. Uh, so he's, he's not obviously going to be able to compose or do it for you here, but he's going to have a, he's going to be here as well. And I'm going to introduce you to, come on, why don't you all come on? Super. So, this, this is, is the exciting. advantage of having children. It's free. So, so you, you clearly have uh, DNA for the skill that you've passed on. You, you've just not honed it probably, right? No, no, no. I don't know. I can't do a thing. So anyway, <laughs> I, I, I put on my CD player and I stream music. That's about all I do. So that's my daughter, Leah. Hi, Leah. Jay Jangir. Hi, Jangir. I'm just going to quickly interrupt. Is he okay after last night? <laughs> I was, uh, it was a tough result last night. It was difficult. Yeah. It, it, that's right. That's his passion. So it's, it's yeah. been a tough night. So I'm a, I'm a Tottenham fan and I was supporting Chelsea yesterday. So we have to play three more games because Arsenal qualify ahead of us. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a tough game for sure. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> we're in the top four now. So that's, uh, that's good. Yeah. Anyway, I won't interrupt any further. No, because stay. Let, let, let's do this together. Please. Okay, great. So let's, let's have Leah. Can you just stand here? And... Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think she's going to do a, an original. Yeah, I'm going to do an original. It's called okay. Higher at Last. Sorry, what is it called? It's called Higher at Last. Higher at Last. Okay, super. Here's to all the pain you put me through. It's time I push myself 
demonstration this has been you yeah. truly truly powered your way through like a lawyer <laughs> <laughs> very 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 nice uh, song and really uh, there are a couple of messages in fact that are coming in to say she's very talented she's got a beautiful voice so please let her know i will i will tell her she's just thank, thank you for bringing them on that was fantastic so my son would have also done something but he composes and he has a keyboard and that would have taken time to set up. yeah maybe another time yeah sure okay so thank you for doing that but you do we'd like for you to also talk a little bit about you know uh, maybe perhaps we, we know that western music is something you really enjoy as as do you history and you also recently went off on a trip to a very interesting country uh, iran am i right That's right. That's right. So, so, would you like to perhaps tell us about your trip to Iran? I, I love travel. So, at least once a year, my wife and I go off in May, which is normally the got vacation. So that's when we plan it for. Uh, and there's a lot you learn and enjoy when you travel. And Iran was a place I'd always wanted to go to. I'd read a lot about the history, mm -hmm. so I was keen on on seeing it for myself. And it was actually becoming more and more difficult to go to Iran. Uh, and we we managed to go there last year, just before the serious sanctions came in. Mm -hmm. So they came in, I think, and on the seventh or tenth of May, and we were there just before that. Uh, and we had a love, wonderful trip. We Mahindra and Mahindra actually had sponsored uh, a self-drive trip. So we had six or seven of their SUVs, and they'd given us uh, a driver and mechanics, and then all of I didn't drive, but all my friends drove. uh foolish for me not to have driven because i drive everywhere but i thought i didn't want to drive in iran but when i got there i realized that actually it would have been great uh so we drove right through it is one it's a wonderful country it's the people are very friendly they're very free it's amazing uh, what freedom there is on on the streets there you you wouldn't imagine it reading about it including the women uh, are extremely free uh and uh, of course the culture and the civilization is 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 fantastic so you see you, you you not only the islamic civilization but when you go south to shiraz you see the old uh, persian sites 
uh, of Persepolis, Pasar Gade. Pasar Gade is a very important site. Uh, probably you've not heard of it, but it's where uh, Cyrus the Great, the first Persian emperor, had his palace and then he's buried there. So his tomb, his tomb is extremely simple. It's just this. Uh, I picked up this shirt. I keep it here. It's just this little, I don't know if you can see it. It's, that's it. It's just a, it's a mound of rocks, actually. Uh, but it's, it's just simple, so pretty. Just stone. It's just stone and it, it sits in a, in a, in a valley uh, with the backdrop of some hills. So it's like an amphitheater. And this thing in the middle, it, it's very moving. Uh, and of course, Plutarch claims, that's I think apocryphal because you don't see this. He, say, he claims there used to be an in inscription on that tomb which said, uh, I am Cyrus, king of Anshan, I created the Persian empire, do not, and I did this and I did that, and do not therefore grudge me this small mound of stones uh, as my burial place. Wasn't uh, Cyrus also the same, gen the same king? Who, who I think he overtook an empire and then said, worship who you need to, do what you need to, I'm not going to interrupt. He had a, a very wise outlook. It's not, look, in that era, in that time, it was rare to get a king who didn't war, who didn't wage war, if he could. Uh, there was, of course, death. There was, it's, it's not that he, that he didn't spill blood. Of course he did. Mm -hmm. But his philosophy, once he conquered a land, was not to rape, loot and pillage and subjugate the people. He actually wanted to win over the people. So Babylon was the other great power which he finally defeated uh, in 539 BC. And when he went there, uh, he basically said, uh, and we have it now recorded because he did these cylinders of clay, which were issued and one of them has been found. Uh, where he says, look, you're free to own your own property. Uh, go about your way of life, do your business, worship your God. I have great respect and I bow before your God, Marduk. Uh, and uh, some say that that was very politically shrewd because <laughs> he was winning over their support. But whatever it was, it was also extremely courageous and farsighted Correct. because he then got their loyalty. Uh, and there was no point in just slamming around and smashing their temples and, and, and uh, you know, uh, insisting that they convert and things like that. Because this was a far stronger support base that he got. And that's how he built his huge empire. And his empire actually was, at that point of time, the largest empire in the world. It was the first attempt at globalization because it stretched from parts of India, right up to the Indus, up to Afghanistan and into Turkmenistan on to the east. And all the way to uh, what was then Palestine and the Levant and then into uh, Cappadocia and what is modern day Turkey to the okay. west. So it was a huge, it was a huge empire and then made even larger by his son conquering Egypt after his death, things like that. So uh, that really had always fascinated me so to stand next to his tomb uh, was, was a very moving moment. Uh, and then to see Persepolis and you know, again, we all unfortunately been schooled and brought up on the Western idea of history. And, and the more you read, the more you realize that that is, I'm not saying it's false, but that's one perspective. And a, another huge perspective has, has been taken out of that story, and which is the Eastern uh, story of history. And if you see our own history in India, and, and another person I have, to, I have great, great admiration and respect for is Ashoka the Great. Uh, another person who, after Kalinga, completely transformed himself and the way he ruled. And... He was one of the first, in fact, the first Indian emperor who had a, a realm almost as large as United India. He was one of the largest, uh, he united diverse peoples, cultures, and he did it ultimately not with force, but with reason and philosophy. He was the, he was the philosopher king. Plato always said, states will never be happy until philosophers are kings and kings are philosophers. And Ashoka the Great was exactly that. So amazing. I mean... His rock edicts, for example, uh, the seventh rock edict, all religions must reside everywhere. He said this in the fourth century, 300 BC, he lived around about very, 300 BC. Very ahead of the century. for his time. Yes. Fantastic. You know, so great, great, uh, those are great things to read about and to learn about. So I'm fascinated with all that. And how, what was the food like in Iran? Uh, that's... Uh, I, I, there we must confess that after the first day or two, it got very tiresome. And, and we realized why. Uh, and this is a big difference between India, we're used to spices. Correct. 
Nola food. And even though you may not have very thikka food or spicy food, you'll still have some spice flavor. in your food. It's very flavorful. Our food flavorful. is flavorful. Their food was not that flavorful because they didn't use spices. So in the first day or two, we managed. But then literally after the third or fourth day, I must confess, uh, it got very tiresome. Uh, and maybe we were not ordering the right things. Okay. Uh, until we came down to Shiraz, where we had superb food. Okay. Shiraz was a, a very cosmopolitan uh, city you know you could be anywhere and uh, there the food was much better on the way was difficult yeah but what is their traditional food like what do they traditionally eat so essentially they ate their or certainly we seem to be keep on we sort of kept on getting uh, these long uh, kebabs which they call kubi days okay. which were like a sikh kebab but without the flavor so, <laughs> what a disappointment yeah exactly so misleading right Exactly. And then uh, you had rice with saffron in it and with ghee or butter. But, the, you, you know, and then a lot of yogurt, a lot of dahi, which is what I was basically eating okay. after some time. You know? <laughs> so that was nice. Their bread is nice. But, okay. yeah, it, it could have been better. But it didn't bother us. We were seeing so much and, you know, there was so much to do and, and see there that there, there wasn't really an issue. And dry fruits are fantastic. So you can, you can, you know, make up with things like that. Do they, they love Indians. Do they, they, love Indians. they love Indians. Yeah, they all we, they took to us very positively, uh, oh, particularly nice. because we were Indians that, that made a huge difference. So that was good. Fantastic. So it was a good uh, trip. Yeah, it was a great trip. Lovely. Thank you for sharing with us what Iran is like. While you were talking, I was I was feeling like, you know, there were parts of it that were just playing out like a movie. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs>